I am so glad that someone is finally talking about this because in the Alzheimer's community, especially sugar has been something that has been thrown around a lot recently as being a possible culprit for the increasing rates of Alzheimer's and dementia. Beyond the children that you're going to affect with this book, I think it's going to help a lot of adults too. Hi everyone. Welcome back to Mind What Matters. Today we are talking with Dr. Michael Gorin. He wrote the book Sugar Proof with Dr. Emily Ventura. It is the hidden dangers of sugar that are putting your child's health at risk and what you can do. Um, Michael is a professor of pediatrics at the Children's Hospital of Los Angeles, which is affiliated with the Keck School of Medicine at the University of Southern California. He is the program director for diabetes and obesity at the Sabin Research Institute, and he holds the Dr. Robert C. and Veronica Atkins Endowed Chair in Childhood Obesity and Diabetes. Dr. Gorin also serves as the co-director of the USC Diabetes and Obesity Research Institute. He's a native of Glasgow, Scotland, and received his PhD from the University of Manchester in the United Kingdom prior to postdoctoral training in the United States. He previously served on the Faculty of Medicine at the University of Vermont, the Department of Nutrition Sciences at UAB, the Department of Preventative Medicine at USC prior to joining the Children's Hospital of Los Angeles. His research has been continuously funded by the National Institute of Health and other foundations for the past 30 years, during which he has raised almost $50 million in funding to support this work. He's published over 350 professional peer-reviewed articles and reviews. He is the editor of the Childhood Obesity Causes, Consequences, and Intervention Approaches, and the editor of Dietary Sugars and Health. He has been the recipient of a number of scientific awards for his research and teaching, and he lives in Silver Lake, Los Angeles with his wife, Lori, a film editor, and his two teenage daughters and their cat. Good to see you. It's good to see you too. Sugar Proof, which is the book you co-wrote with Emily Ventura, The Hidden Dangers of Sugar That Are Putting Your Child's Health at Risk. I don't think I've ever read anything that has made my just heart stop and say, wow, everything I'm doing in my life right now needs to change. I'm going to say, I'm going to say wow to that too. That's amazing. I am so glad that someone is finally talking about this because in the Alzheimer's community, especially sugar has been something that has been thrown around a lot recently um, as being a possible culprit for the increasing rates of Alzheimer's and dementia. So I'm just beyond the children that you're going to affect with this book, I think it's going to help a lot of adults too. Um, And I'm just really excited to talk to you about all of it. I have about 80 million questions for you, and we're just going to dive right in if that's okay. Okay. So the first- Absolutely, yes. Thank you. The first question I have for you, I know that you're a parent yourself of two teenage girls, but what was it that triggered your interest in and your research around sugar? Like, where did this all kind of begin? Yeah, it's a great question. Um, and it's hard to know where, when it actually began because this is, the, this is the research I've been doing for 35 years. So uh, for, for my entire research career, I've been uh, looking at research on trying to understand uh, how childhood nutrition affects growth and development Mostly for the first half of that, I was focused on excess weight gain uh, and diet. Uh, but then the landscape changed. I mean, we it moved, the issue moved well beyond obesity 20 years ago because we started seeing adult onset diseases in children like type 2 diabetes and fatty liver disease. And I'd say starting about 10 years ago, the piece is starting to the pieces started to come together. The research was showing it kept landing on sugar. We weren't originally um, looking at sugar specifically. We were looking at diet in general, but it just just kept popping up in our analysis. Uh, When we were looking at diet and weight gain or diet and diabetes risk or diet and fatty liver or whatever, sugar kept coming up and you know, then we became very interested in fructose as a sugar because we noticed that, you know, we did the studies. We, about 10 years ago, we did a study asking what is in a soda? What is in juice? 
what is it? We're, we're just like giving these things to our kids and I don't even know what's in it. Right. So we did these studies where we sent samples off for analysis and we knew that kids were drink were consuming more sugar than previous generations. But what became clear is that we're giving them different types of sugar, more fructose and in different forms, more liquid sugar. And the research was also showing that fructose in particular was damaging, that liquid sugar is more damaging. So the pieces of the puzzle came together in my head to tell a compelling story. Kids are consuming more sugar, different types of sugar, more fructose, more liquid form, and that those different forms are much more harmful for different ways that we'll probably talk about. Um, so it became a story that had to be told. And I didn't wanna just talk about the science. We wanted to come up with solutions and strategies for parents everywhere, not just to say, oh, don't, you shouldn't give your kids sugar. We wanted, we wanted real life, practical, simple solutions that were based on research as well. So that's kind of a little bit of the background. And the more I got into it, the more the story became more compelling and the, the research is happening fast as well. And I wanted to put that into the hands of people because we do the research and maybe 10, 20 people, 30 people, 100 people read that research paper, but this is, this is relevant for parents everywhere. And I wanted to make that new science relevant and digestible for everybody. Well, and I would just like to speak to that. You know, I think that you make it more than digestible. And, you know, part of the problem with anyone who's involved, it, well, anyone who's around the medical field, meaning isn't a doctor, but that it's involved in something that involves medicine, right? Like take myself and the nonprofit that I run for Mind What Matters, you know, it's really hard to get a lot of medical data thrown at you at once and be able to absorb it in a way that you can either explain to someone else or even really fully understand it yourself. And the way that you guys have put it in your book, I wasn't able to just absorb it, but I was able to explain it to my kids in a way that they understand. And I have mm. three children, Michael, from the ages of 13, 10, and five. And, you know, maybe, maybe not that five-year-old is fully understanding, but definitely my 10 and 13-year-old did. Um, so Good. I just, I'd love to applaud you guys on the way that you were able to really break it down, some some big information and some really hard to understand information in a way that just mm. makes it, you know, easily relatable. Um, well, I, I had to relearn um, the way I write and the way I communicate because, um, it's a very different um, approach, as, as you just pointed out. And um, I had a great editor and a great agent who drummed into me the four words, news that you can use. <laughs> and so every time I talk about the research, I, you know, I have to make it, I want to make it relevant. Right. And I want to make it applicable. And I want to break it down because also when we wrote it, we knew that parents everywhere were going to have to explain this to kids. So it's almost like a double layer of, of, of interpretation, both for parents and for kids. And we went through iterations and went through the process trying to, trying to achieve that in. So it's really happy. I'm really happy to hear that um, it landed well. Well, we're going to probably make this like a three-part series with you um, and Emily. Hopefully she can join us on the next couple of podcasts. I think that this is so much information to try and consume in one small sitting. Um, and I really just, I'm going to sort of go towards asking you questions in the direction of your book. So we'll kind of just take it that way and we'll get as far as we can. Um, okay. But one of the questions I really think is important for people to understand, it's, it's at the beginning of your book, but you talk about how in you know early 1800s, the average person only consumed about a teaspoon of sugar a day. And now here we are in 2021, and we're close to 45 teaspoons a day. And, you know, that was probably the most spellbinding part of your book for me was recognizing every time it says four grams of sugar in anything, that's equal to taking a teaspoon of sugar and just pouring it in a cup and saying, okay, for every four grams, it is a teaspoon of sugar. 
And when you start measuring things that way, man, it adds up fast. But why do you think that that happened? And and I know you know why, but I want you to explain for our listeners why there has been such a dramatic increase in the the amount of sugar that we are consuming and giving our children. Yeah, I mean, I think there's multiple episodes to that story. You know, I mean, it used to be that sugar was was for for, for the very rich. Um, when it was first introduced, it was it was a luxury item. Um, King, Hen- you know, think of King Henry the Eighth and his, you know his feasts and his merriment. I mean, this was, this was unusual um, and, and specific to, 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 to the Royal when it was first introduced. But, you know, I think through food processing and availability, um, the story changed as, as we learned how to grow and extract sugar, make it more broadly available. And, and, and then you know, in the 19... 19- 70s with the introduction of high fructose corn syrup, the food industry came up with an even even uh, easier way to get sweetener out of uh, um, corn in this particular case. Um, then at the same time, of course, there was the whole uh, low fat craze movement uh, mm-hmm. and low fat meant food food producers had to replace flavor with something else. And that was uh, sweetness, which kind of, um, you know, when you take fat out of food, it becomes without character or taste or substance. So food companies put sugar back in. And at that point we had high fructose corn syrup. So it's basically a combination of multiple different factors over, over the last couple of centuries that made sugar um, more more available, more abundant. But you know, then there's a, like the question: Well, why did we why do we want it? And that's because we crave it. It's it's a it's a very tasty ingredient. It makes t- food taste good, which is great. I mean, I'm all for great food. I'm a big fan of great tasting food. I love to eat. Um, but sugar in itself and sweetness is addictive. It's, uh, we, we, we crave it. And so um, food companies know that they have to add more to make people like food um, because they know it's the sweetness that sells. And, and then when you layer on top of that, the whole issue of development and the fact that kids are actually born with a built-in preference for sweetness, which was, supposed to be protective. So this this kind of innate craving of sweetness that we have was designed for uh, favoring breast milk, which is sweet and favoring acquisition of, of, of decent food that hadn't spoiled or gone off right. and avoiding toxic berries from the forest floor. That's how we were built, but it it doesn't jive with the with the food environment that I just described. That we have now. Uh, yeah. So there's a mismatch between what we were designed to do and the environment in which we're now living. And the food companies actually market towards children, do they not? And then there's marketing. Yeah. So so food companies know that sweetness sells. They know that infants and kids have a built-in preference for sweetness and they market specifically to them. So uh, 80% of foods marketed towards kids have some type of added sugar. Wow. And can you speak to that just a little bit? So there's a difference between, because that was also one of the most awakening parts of your book to me is that, you know, something can say that has, let's say nine grams of sugar in it. And these are snacks that, you know, even if you think you're being a healthy family and you're giving your kids healthy snacks, you know, the organic um, yogurt tubes or the apple sauces that come in the squeeze pouches, you think, okay, no, no, it's it's organic and it's only nine grams of sugar. That doesn't seem so much, but then there's added sugar. 
and sometimes the added sugars, which that's what I really want you to talk about what those are and how they kind of creep into foods, but they're not regulated. It doesn't have to say on the package how much added sugar that is. And when you're adding up the total number of grams of sugar in something, you have to add all of that together, not just the, you know, nine grams of sugar. Yeah. I mean, this is, this is an important point. I'm talking almost entirely about added sugars. So the only thing that I'm, you know, whole fruits are not added sugars in its natural form of whole fruit. Uh, and, the, and the sugar from, from milk products, which is lactose, uh, we're not talking about that either. We're talking about sugars added to food. Now, new food labels uh, are supposed to differentiate the natural sugars from the added sugars. So let's to take a, a yogurt, for example, a yogurt pot may have, let's say 20 grams of sugar, but 10 of that might be from the lactose, from the dairy. We're not concerned about that at all. You don't have to count that. You don't have to count that. Okay. Food la- the food labels, and by the end of 2021, all food labels, but most of them now should already have added sugars as a separate line item. So you wanna look out for the added sugars and there should be minimal added sugars. Let's say in a yogurt, for example, uh, maybe there's some added sugars, but you should you should be trying to minimize those added sugars. But there's it's complicated because there's 200 different, there's more than 200 different names for added sugar. So it used to be that you could just look at the ingredient list and you'd see sugar as the number one item or the number two item. And you'd know that it was the most abundant ingredient in the particular food. But now with over 200 names, food companies can kind of break that down. They could have five different sugars in, uh, and, and just kind of put it lower down in the list because they've broken it out into five different ingredients. Mm-hmm. Uh, so you have to now look out for those 500 different names. I mean, that's totally overwhelming, I know, but right, you can ma- remember. <laughs> but there, you know, we try to break it down in the book uh, so that it makes it easy for you to recognize them. But, you know, we're not, I, I come home from the grocery store all the time with something that looks too good to be true. And then you kind of look at it later in the comfort of your home. You're like, oh my God, what was I, you know, what was I doing? It's obvious this, there's like, three different sugars in here. You know, there's a reason why something tastes so good because it's got so much sweetener in it. And And then there's all the ad, there's the low calorie sweeteners as well. That's a whole other story of non-caloric sweeteners. Cause some, a food, a food. So you have to look at the, 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 you have to look at the nutrition label, which will break down sugars from added sugars. But you also have to look at the ingredient list and then something can say, no added sugars, all natural, no added sugars, but maybe it's got stevia or monk fruit or some other added sugar and some other sweetener in there. So it's really confusing. I mean, that's, that's so overwhelming. And I think, you know, you, you brought up, you know, maladextrin or dextrose or basically anything with the the last word os is just code for sugar. Yes. And why are these added sugars so bad for you? Well, it, 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 it's, there's multiple effects of, of, of excess sugar. And it's, you know, again, it's, there's a dose effect. So we're not saying that no sugars uh, should be consumed because some sugar is perfectly okay. It's, you know, it's, it's additive, it's cumulative and is it, you know, and it's hidden. So um, there's no need for it to be there. So Basically, we need to look out for the total amount of sugar that we're consuming, and um, because the effects of sugars on growing bodies are dose dependent, so you want to try and minimize it. You don't have to, you have to, you don't have to eliminate it completely. It's just not going to work anyway. It's not sustainable. But excess sugar can affect the growing body from the brain to the toe, so it could be. Um, studies show effects or associations with brain development, with learning ability, memory development, uh, gut health, 
uh, liver health, heart health, uh, weight gain, uh, inflammatory conditions like asthma, eczema, uh, and so on. So sugar seems to have broad effects on the, on the body. And there's a reason why kids are more susceptible, which is another kind of significant uh, aspect for, for, or another significant inspiration to write the book was the realization that kids are actually more susceptible to the damaging effects of sugar. Why? Because they're, they're growing, their, their, their organs aren't yet built or their organs are being built and are derailed by too much sugar. Wow. Whew. And that's another part of your book that I thought was so interesting is you talk about how when kids have a buildup of, you know, excess sugar in their bodies that actually fat builds up inside of their organs and how that can be a precursor to all kinds of diseases later in life. And I love that expression, you know, you guys poked fun at the old expression, you are what you eat. Um, but you're also, you eat or you, you feel how you eat. So it doesn't just affect their organs um, from a health standpoint, but it can also affect their mental health. Um, mm -hmm. And you talked about how sugar was really detrimental to like what you just touched on with memory. You guys did, a, I think, a random study where you know one group of kids had a ton of sugar in their diets, the other didn't. And I think maybe the kids who had a lot of sugar also had saturated fats. And when they were given a series of tests, the kids that were had, you know, had the higher sugar diets and the higher saturated fat diets really performed less or performed worse on the test because their working memory was not as good. Um, so I think that, you know, the fat buildup inside the organs is definitely one side of it that I'd like you to talk about, but then also their, their behavior and their ability to sustain attention. I mean, that's a huge thing in the world right now with kids, the rising rates of ADHD and, you know, just memory problems. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, both, both are really important points to consider. Um, we don't know if there's a specific cause and effect link between sugar and ADHD, but there's certainly information to suggest that sugar can exacerbate that problem uh, and that uh, reducing sugar can help with, with the symptoms and the management of ADHD. Uh, we also know, as parents, we know, right, that uh, too much sugar can change the way your kids are behaving. Yes. Uh, we've, we're, we're, so there, there's actually research that tries to say that that doesn't exist, that there's no effect of, of sugar on, on behavior, but Ask any parent and they'll tell you that that is absolutely true. And it, it's probably going to vary from day to day and vary from kid to kid. And that's absolutely okay and understandable because everybody's different and um, there's multiple factors at play. But sugar does affect disposition and mood and behavior. And it's, it's, it's all to do with um, rapid glucose spikes and rapid glucose falls. Um, and that's why we focus a lot on, on, on breakfast, for example, where you tend to get a, a, a huge bolus of sugar in the morning, uh, which causes a, a, a rise in your blood sugar. So when you eat sugar or, or simple carbohydrates like white flour, your blood glucose levels will go up rapidly. Um, because that's how, what it breaks down to, and your body needs that glucose to function. But what happens is kids are so efficient at taking that energy out of their blood because they need it for, for growth and development that it falls so quickly. So if it goes up quickly, it falls really rapidly too. And then when, when it falls rapidly, they become hypoglycemic, which is low blood sugar. Mm -hmm. And you probably know as an adult what that feels like to be hypoglycemic, right? You feel crappy and lousy and- Jittery and angry. Yeah, and, and hungry probably. 
yep. um, your, your, our, our children just end up rolling around on the floor mm-hmm. um, and, and hungry, hungry and angry or what we call hangry. Angry. Um, because they're hypoglycemic, their blood sugars are low, they need more. And then what happens is they get fed more high glycemic foods and their blood sugars rise rapidly. And then they're in this it's a pattern. roller coaster. It's a pattern. So just like you and I as adults know that we have to try and keep our blood glucose levels controlled even, the same is true for kids. And they're more susceptible to those rapid ups and downs because their bodies are so efficient at clearing that glucose out of the blood that they become hypoglycemic very quickly. But you know, that's so hard because we live in a culture. Um, I, I think maybe it was my dad actually that said this to me recently, but you know, he was remarking on how, you know, even when we were kids, we were never given as much candy and as much cakes and cookies. And he's, you know, I think his point was just this one big long holiday from Halloween through Easter. You know, it's, it feels like you're, at, I personally feel like I'm still throwing out Halloween candy when it's Christmas and they're starting to bring bags of treats home from school. And then you turn around and you come back from Christmas break and we just got through it, right? Valentine's Day. Um, I mean, my kids are hating me for this, I'm sure, but I just took a huge round of the of the Valentine's candy and just pitched it because I was like, you guys, we just got finished with our Christmas stuff, you know? And here we are in another one. And before we know it, Easter is going to be around the corner. And, you know, at school, they have treats. If you do well on a test, you get treats. If you are at a friend's house after school, you know, for a special play date or a sleepover, the moms are baking cupcakes or cake or cookies or what have you. It's everywhere. And I feel like our kids are just in this tsunami of sugar. So, Mm -hmm. of course, they're susceptible to it because it tastes really good and why wouldn't they want to eat it? They certainly don't know that it's bad for them, um, but they're ingesting it all the time. And it's not and just a, in small and, bits. Yeah, and they have a built-in preference for it. So they crave it more. But um, yeah, I mean, this is the struggle. And it's, you know, again, the solution is not to be the mom handing out carrot sticks for the Easter bunny um, or, or at Halloween. I think, you know, kids does it, kids want to grow up and have fun, and these are important traditions, and we're not here to take them away. I think they're an important part of being a kid. So the, the, the solution is to find a better balance that it doesn't have to be a nonstop tsunami, that we can portion it out better or mix it up with um, other uh, treats that we, you know, or, or find all the hidden sugars, like, you know, why we should if we find all the hidden sugars and get rid of them, then we can kind of reduce our sugar burden so we can enjoy some of those treats. If we can get rid of some of the big culprits like juice and soda that are just like big extra bolus doses of sugar that are really play no no nutritional role, no cultural value to those. Um, if we can get rid of those, then then it leaves more room to enjoy some of those sweet treats and and then just kind of portioning it out better um, also would be good. And that's the seven day challenge is designed uh, to kind of break up and reset some of those things. So the more- That's what we're on now. Yes, cool. So yeah, curious to hear how it's going. And the reason we came up with that was we know that you can reset this preference because the more we feed this, built-in preference, the more you can amp up the craving. So just like it can be amped up, it can also be dampened down. And the seven day challenge is meant to say, okay, folks, time for a reboot, mm-hmm. right? It's, it's just, it's literally a reboot um, or a reset. And I'm curious to hear how your family's doing on it because it, it can be tough for the first few days, but we know that after a week, you you can literally see the difference in your kids. And we've had some just some incredible stories of response of how kids have responded to that reset. Not to say you're not going to get back into a tsunami, but right. you, when you when when you what what will happen? Hopefully, the idea is that you'll do the reset, and then 
you'll ramp up but more slowly because you'll have gotten rid of some of the things you realize you didn't need mm -hmm. and you can live without perfectly well and so you'll you know you may get back up into it to, to, to a sugar but it'll be less of a tsunami and then you'll do another reset and gradually you know you 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 you, you begin to eliminate all the sources of extra sugars that you didn't really need in the first place. That was one of my favorite tips you said is that, you know, basically any recipe that you're cooking with, um, you could half the sugar and you probably wouldn't even notice it. And, you know, I can even think back like the banana bread recipe that I always make. I just ran out of sugar the last time I was making it. And I did half the recipe, the sugar in the recipe. I couldn't tell a difference at all. So that's one thing I'm really excited to try. Um, and yeah, I would I'm say sure your kids, I'm sure your kids loved it just as much. They, they did. They couldn't tell a difference. No, yeah. not in the slightest. And, you know, as for how they're taking it, I feel like they obviously know what mom does for a living. And my nonprofit is based on Alzheimer's caregivers. So that's a huge part of our life. And we talk about it. My mother has early onset um, and they know, right, that I'm not making these changes for our family to hurt them or to take away fun, but more like you said, just to like slowly kind of pull back the reins a little bit on, you know, what I felt like was just a free for all. And, you know, I thought, like I said, that we were fairly healthy, but when I examined our pantry, I mean, even the Annie's organic um, granola bars, you know, you add up, I think it's, so it, you don't have to add in the nine grams of sugar, but that's nine extra grams of added sugar. Well, that's just like feeding your kid two and a half teaspoons of sugar. And, and mm -hmm. I, I would say my youngest, especially he's learned the art of rummaging through the pantry by himself. He'll go in there twice a day and get one of those. Mm -hmm. And, you know, you or I would never put three teaspoons of sugar in our coffee in the morning, but that's essentially what my five-year-old is doing, you know, just a couple times mm -hmm. a day. Um, and yeah, that's not that's... even considered a treat for him. That's just a snack. So it does. It's a great analogy. I think the, I think the visuals of the measuring out and the um, kind of comparing it to what you would, would or would not put in your tea or your coffee is pretty good. I've, you know, we use that quite a bit. So I think that's pretty powerful um, that visualization. Mm -hmm. It's definitely helped for them, I think, and they're taking part in it. And, you know, my oldest is excited about trying to help me find recipes now that, you know, are better choices. And he's of course, scouring TikTok. He's a teenager. So he said, there's tons of TikTok challenges for food mom that we can try. So, um, he's excited about it. And I think, Great. You know, we'll just kind of see how it goes. We're only on day two, so I'll have to oh keep boy. you posted. But day day two is tough. This is um, you're you're at you're at the tough part of it, um, yeah. because this is this is when you may your kids may start to really respond negatively. Then you may even have withdrawal symptoms like headaches or you know a lot of tiredness, mm -hmm. um, fatigue. So. When, but once you get over that hump, it, you can start to see you, the improvements. That's when you see the improvement. So yeah, make sure everybody stays hydrated and has has you know yummy yummy food to eat and good snacks. Yeah, that's what we're trying to focus on. Lots of protein right now, um, Michael. One thing so I did, what's for dinner tonight? Oh goodness, um, <laughs> we haven't gotten that far. Let's hope okay. we have power. Let's hope we have power <laughs> tonight. <laughs> Nashville is getting yeah. another huge wave of wow. weather. Like literally it's rolling in. I'm starting to see the snow coming down again. So really, wow. Everyone's it's just so crossing crazy. their fingers that we don't wind up like Texas right now. Um, Man. but I think, um, maybe steak. I don't know. That's the other thing we're really trying hard to, to reduce is our red meat levels as a family. You know, we used to probably have it once a week, maybe even twice if you added in pork tenderloin or something. And I'm trying to take us more towards a plant-based diet. I, I know that the science is not there yet um, that sort of proves that a plant-based diet is better for preventing Alzheimer's and other cognitive decline, but I think it's getting really close. And I think that certainly the evidence is there that the lower amount of meat that you have, the better, you know? Um, mm -hmm. that's, that's been a tough one for us to, to kind of move away from, but it's mainly because it's such an easy thing for mom to fix, you know, dad mm. can just go out and grill and you don't have to do anything. Um, 
But anyway, okay. So we don't have a ton of time left, but I do want to just touch on, there's obviously a part of your book that touches very close to home on Alzheimer's because that's obviously what Mind One Matters is all about. Um, I would like you to just quickly describe how much of a role you think sugar has in the play of potential diagnosis um, of Alzheimer's disease. You know, there's a lot of evidence that says women are two thirds more likely to get Alzheimer's than men. And one of the things I've often wondered, and I've, I've asked other neurologists is that, you know, women tend to drink a lot of wine and a lot of white wine. Um, that's just typically, you know, what women gravitate more towards. And there's an awful lot of sugar in wine. And so I've kind of wondered myself if potentially that's, you know, a, a cause. Yeah. I mean, I, I should first say the, these are the research is so complicated to really show definitively any cause and effect in these situations. Obviously, Alzheimer's disease is a, you know, a long term, slow, slowly evolving condition. Um, multiple factors at play. Um, Diet's only part of it, and even within diet, there's multiple factors, and it may be different for different people. Uh, so we're just lear- beginning to learn so much about it. Uh, but we, we, you know, we we do know that sugar and excess sugar can affect brain health and brain development. Um, there's there's evidence. These are all association studies. Or you know, so I should temper it by saying that these are not. There's no simple cause and effect studies, but there's certainly association studies showing that long-term habitual consumption of high sugar diet uh, is associated with um, smaller brains and effects on structural brain development. Um, Studies in animal models show it's related to inflammation in the hippocampus region of the brain, for example. And, and, and then there's also information now emerging from uh, long-term consumption of diet sodas, which again, it's an association study linking uh, diet soda consumption to higher risk of Alzheimer's disease. Um, so we have to look at uh, th- these low calorie sweeteners, which act very differently. They are still very sweet, but they act very differently in the body and may affect brain development. Um, so it's complicated. Um, I think they play a role. I don't know specifically. I don't know definitively in terms of causation, but for me, the evidence is there to warrant um, reducing uh, sugary beverages and diet sodas, sugary beverages, because it's such a major contributor to over consumption of sugar and unnecessary. Um, and diet, and, and this, this, the sweeteners that are infiltrating our diet now, um, I think are potentially harmful over the long term. They haven't been studied. I mean, food companies can put it, put a product in a food. It doesn't cause cancer in a lab rat. So they can call it, they can get it approved as generally recognized as safe without ever really knowing what the long-term impact of those products are. So, you know, the more you can move towards a healthy, I mean, I wouldn't say even say plant-based, but just whole foods type approach, you know, that doesn't have to be purely plant-based, but obviously more fruits and vegetables in their whole form are going to be better off long-term and less processed food. Sure, of course. Is there any way to... I mean, let's say you're sitting in my shoes and you have a teenager already um, that as a kid, you know, he didn't I have get a lot two. Of- I, have, I have two teenagers already. Okay, good. <laughs> so I'm in good yeah. company right now. Yes. Um, but let's say you've got, you've kind of made these mistakes and, you know, I certainly made the healthiest choices that I thought at the time, you know, I did give him juice when he woke up from his afternoon nap. I did it in a sippy cup. We would water it down, you know, like he'd have this much juice and this much water. Um, we were smart enough to do that. Looking back on it, I wish I had never given him any. Um, and we've certainly had our fair share of treats. You know, I love to bake. Um, we're a big cooking family. I've been a big baker. 
um, our, you know, their whole childhoods, you know, chocolate chip cookies on a Saturday night are not a rare thing. You know, I'm always making something. Um, but let's say you've kind of done the damage, so to speak. Um, and you're really looking to sort of rewind and, and unwrap it. Is there a way to reverse these effects of too much sugar and, and kind of help some of the fat that's made its way into, you know, our kids' livers and other organs? Is there a way to kind of decrease it over time or is once the damage is done, that's it? No, no. I, I mean, absolutely that um, these things are, are reversible. Uh, and even, even again, going back to the seven day challenge, I mean, the reason we came up with seven days was because re research shows that seven days of eliminating sugar will have beneficial effects, not just on behavior and disposition, but under the skin in terms of uh, circulating lipids and blood pressure and uh, circulating glucose levels and so on. You will get improvements even from short term reduction and the. the but the, wherever you're at in this spectrum, the, the more you can reduce, the better, and the more benefit you'll get. So it's never too late, and no small reduction is not enough. So even a, you know, a small reduction, if your kids were on two sodas per day, going to one would be great. If they're drinking juice every day, then diluting it 50-50 would be great. Because you've, you've, that's a that's a significant reduction. Or, or using if you're baking cookies every Saturday night because that's your thing. Fine, just use half as much sugar, and then you've cut your sugar in half, and still enjoying the the uh, the tradition of having those cookies. So there's and you'll get benefits from that. So I think wherever you're at, I, I, you will get benefit even from, from, from small reductions. So absolutely. It's Don't never give too up, late. In other words, we've never done yeah, this I mean, thing. I mean, fortunately I've never allowed those into my house. So I kind of, I guess I can feel good about that, but. Um, never done the what? The soda? Sodas. Soda? Yeah. We've yeah. never done sodas. And, you know, I've never been big on just like giving a big cup of juice or something like that. I'm just more, honestly, I was more stunned at the amount of sugars in just the everyday things that have made it into our pantry. I mean, even my son asked, you know, could we still have a frozen pizza every once in a while? And I opened the freezer drawer and I took the box out and I said, you know, you're not going to believe this. There's nine added grams of sugar in one slice, one slice of pizza. One slice. And so, you know, I, I don't know where it is. I have a list on here. I'd love to, yeah. I mean, I'd love to see that. Um we, we, we should highlight that. That's one slice of pizza. That's one. amazing. Isn't that crazy? Yeah. I'll send you a picture Which, of the box after. Yeah, I want to see that. I want to see that. You and I know, you and I know that there's no need for added sugars in a pizza. Why? Why? Yeah. <laughs> That's just additives. That's crazy. But you yeah. have on your, in your book, there's a chapter where you actually break it down by age, what kids should have. And I think you know, for a 12 year old, 24 added grams of sugar a day. That's not total grams, but for added grams, um, that they shouldn't have more than that. My five year old, on the other hand, shouldn't have more than 17 grams. Well, if Gaines had two slices of pizza and, you know, anything else sweet that day, he's hit his limit. Um, that's so hard. You know, that's a really challenging thing. And, you know, I, we are fortunate enough that we have the means to be able to go to the store and make healthy choices. But, you know, there's such a large population that isn't as, you know, able to, to kind of make these choices. And I think that they're even yeah. more susceptible yeah. to these diseases yeah. because everywhere they go, you know, it's fast food or it's, you know, the quick box of donuts in the grocery store for breakfast or, you know, something like that. And I think these kids are even at more risk. Um, so it's-, Absolutely. it's and, and studies show that, I mean, there's, certainly an income disparity going on mm -hmm. here because fast food and cheap processed food is higher in sugar and that's what um, contributes to, to, to many of these problems. The sugar plus the fact that it's highly processed. Right. It's like a double whammy. Yep. Well, Michael, we could talk for about 
four hours, I think about all of this stuff and we're going to, cause I really want you on our next podcast. I really want you to break down, um, exactly what the difference is between glucose and fructose and how the body breaks them down differently. And also one thing we touched on that, you know, is such an important point is that with all these new added sugars that are, you know, genetically manufactured, we don't really know what they are and our body doesn't know what they are. They've never been designed to process those things. And they're basically just excreted. So we don't really know what's happening with all of that. And I think that that's a really a, a interesting topic that we can kind of jump into yeah. on our next talk. Yeah. I, yeah. Anytime. Uh, happy to do that. Um, there's a lot to talk about and I'm happy to, I mean, one advantage of the Zoom world is we can jump on a Zoom anytime and talk about it. So keep them coming. I'm, ha I'm, I'm happy to, uh, to talk with you. It's fun. Oh, this thank is so you fun. so much. Yeah. Thank you for all you're doing. I mean, I think it's remarkable work that you're doing. So thank you so much. Oh, well, I've just so loved talking to you and I have, like I said, so many more questions. I could fill up your whole afternoon, um, but we will be in touch soon and I can't wait to continue this conversation. Yeah, yeah, happy. Any anytime. Let's do it again. All okay. right, we will. Yep. Hey, take care. I uh, hope you uh, guys weather the storm okay.